Okay, greetings future social workers. Welcome back to our second lecture for our Social Work 530 Marginalized Populations course. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this week for our lecture, we will be discussing social and racial inequality um, as it relates to serving marginalized populations um, as social workers. And so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and bring up my screen to share so that we can engage in the content together. And I will go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint. Let's make me a little bit larger so you can see me as we're talking. Perfect. Okay. So um, welcome to our second lecture. And thank you so much for tuning in. So just a quick reminder before we jump into the content that our lesson um, structure uh, or class structure um, for these lessons will uh, follow the same structure, even though the content will change from each lecture to the next. So we'll begin with a little bit of curriculum review. I'm going to pepper in some media, some videos, some sound clips and things like that periodically throughout the lectures so that we can bring the content to life. I will um, always give an example from a real life scenario um, working with the lesson that I'm teaching um, so that you can see how this application looks in real life. So I'm always going to bring that theoretical concept down to a pragmatic level, okay, when we're talking about implementation of what you're learning. We'll engage in a little bit of thought and discourse related to this discussion. I'll give you some things to reflect on, and then afterwards we'll make sure to end each lecture with our centering exercise, okay? So that's what we have planned for today. All right. So what I wanted to do was first, at this point in the term, you've already been exposed to some coursework, um, some readings and content related to privilege. And so I want to continue to um, sort of ease into our discussion on racial and social inequality by discussing the notion of privilege a little bit more. Now, this is one of those activities that I do live with my classes, but I also want to show you a virtual um, example of how we can engage in this together. So what I wanna do is take you on a little bit of a privilege walk. And obviously, rather than us engaging in this privilege walk together on campus, what I'm gonna do is show you the concept of this privilege walk, another version of it that was done um, and posted on a YouTube channel. Now, typically what I do is in this activity, I would actually take all of you in the class out to a, a, a spot on campus, nice empty spot on campus, and I would ask you all to line up. And what I would do, similar to this video, is ask you a series of questions um, based on how you've been raised uh, and your experiences in the past. These aren't things that you chose in your own life. These are things that have happened to you in the past. And so what I would do is ask you questions like, um, did you have uh, both parents in your home when you were growing up? If you did, take one step forward. Um, if you did not have to worry about, let's say, groceries in your next meal, take a step forward. Um, if you ever were treated differently because of who you are, whether that was race, ability, sexual identity, gender, whatever the case is, take a step back, and so on and so on. Now, by the end of the activity, what we would have is a number of students, every one of the whole class is separated at this point. Some students will be in the front of the pile, you would have some students in the middle, and you would have other students in the back, okay? And then we'll talk about then what that means in relation to privilege, okay? Um, um, and what it means for, for this course and your future career as social workers after you get a chance to watch this video. So this video is gonna walk you through what it's like to engage in the privilege walk uh, virtually. So let me go ahead and take you to the video and actually let me sh make sure that our sharing, okay, computer sound is shared. I just want to make hey, sure. Line up! Line up! Everybody line up! We're about to race! Everybody line up! Shoulder to shoulder! Take off your backpacks! Basketball! Line up! We're about to race! Hey, we are we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. The winner of this race will take this. It's a hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, I'm gonna make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, 
I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I've said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life ladies and gentlemen nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now when I say go on your mark get set go If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. Okay. I hope you found that um, video engaging. I know that that's sometimes the, like I said before in our previous class, what we talk about right is in isn't always comfortable um but it's safe all right and so let me get my screen back up here in the video i thought this was a really perfect example of the activity that we would do typically live <clears throat> um but as you can see you still see that the profound impact that this this particular video has even though we're doing this privileged walk virtually right think about some of the responses that you would have had or the steps that you might have taken forward or might not have taken forward with those same questions, all right, that were presented um, in the video, right, during the privilege walk. Think about the fact that all of those questions were referencing circumstances of environment, not choices that you made. You didn't actively choose if you had two parents involved in your house. You didn't actively choose how much money your parents made. You didn't actively choose the race of your parents, okay, in this process, what your parents look like, what God they worshiped, whatever the case was. And so all of this notion of privilege sometimes is heavily debated outside the field of social work. Most of the time when you talk with other professionals in the context of social work, we say, well, we, we realize privilege exists. Privilege exists for everyone uh, to an extent within our society, but there are some pockets out in the, in the real world that say privilege is fake. 
It's, 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 it's not a real thing. This is a perfect example visually of what privilege looked like. Now, these questions were geared towards socioeconomic status, but you also saw what we refer to as the intersectionality, okay, the overlap between socioeconomic status and race. If you noticed, it was primarily individuals of color, primarily African-American individuals who are at the back of the line in this video. And so this exposes the nature, the nature, I'm sorry, of privilege. And so what's really important to understand is, is that when you're dealing with privilege, a lot of folks want to turn their head. They want to say, I earned what I earned through hard work. The concept of privilege isn't saying that an individual cannot achieve what others achieve through hard work. That's not the argument that's being made. Privilege, like we discussed in the last uh, lecture, is the absence of opportunities or what we discussed was the immunity to social problems that engage others. So yes, those individuals at the back of the line may have been able to beat others and make their way to the front. So no one's saying that you could never make your way to the front, but what we're saying is the journey is longer and you have to work harder to get to the same place. Some of you may have recall a descriptor that you read in your reading is privilege is like walking with the wind towards you against your back. And the absence of privilege or oppression is like walking with the wind in your face, okay? And so this is something as a notion to consider. When you're serving individuals from diverse backgrounds, you not only need to be aware of your own privilege, which is what we're talking about of checking our privilege, right? but understanding the oppression and the dynamics that play into serving others who may have been oppressed. Now here's something important that I also wanna draw your attention into, okay? Sometimes when we do this activity, individuals who have made their way to the front of the, of the, uh, the line, okay? Sometimes feel a guilt about being privileged. I wanna let you know you should not feel guilty for being privileged. You should not feel bad about the fact that you have been blessed with opportunities in this society to advance in your place in life or increase right, your status, your stratification in our society. Like I said before, these are all things that have been done to you environmentally. They're not things that you chose for yourself. So what's really important to understand is if you found that maybe you would be one of those individuals at the front of the line, you shouldn't feel ashamed or guilty. What we're called to do in a social co justice context is utilize our privilege, become an ally, remember this notion of ally in social justice, to serve others, to assist in moving others from the back of the line to the front, to allow other people to have the same opportunities that we have been given through our privilege so they might experience life similarly, okay? And so what's really important to understand, the idea with this exercise is not to villainize those who have been um, blessed with privilege, but to understand that our lot in life is very different. Our experiences are different. Some of you, which I think is, find is always interesting in this context, is some of you may come from the same, let's say, racial background, may be the same gender, whatever the case is, but that doesn't mean you are next to one another in this activity. Some of you could have been in very different places. And so privilege, while there are general institutional um, uh, how do I say it? structures, right? That implement privilege as a society doesn't mean that everyone experiences privilege the same, okay? So I thought that, that was a nice activity for us to engage in. Excuse me. So um, this is a quick reminder. When we left off from the last lesson, we talked about that a social worker's job is to combat the isms, right? That we're fighting against things like ageism, ableism, racism, classism, heterosexism, and all of these other discriminatory mechanisms that exist in our society. Now, for the sake of this lecture today, what we're going to do is focus on the notion of racial and social inequalities, okay, that exist in our, in our um, society. Okay, now this is again the types of oppression on this side here, the left-hand column, all right, that manifest in our society, and in the middle column here, these are primarily the populations that are impacted by the type of oppression, okay? And so this is just for you for a quick review to understand that oppression in our society isn't only isolated to race, it's not only isolated to gender or sexuality or religion, right? 
that the way that we discriminate against, against others in society is multidimensional and it's very complex. It's also important to understand that you may be a uh, uh, multiple identities, sorry, here on the left-hand side, right? So you may, you may factor in your race plus your class, right? Maybe your ability or your religion. And now what you've got is an interplay layers of oppression and how you are um, impacted, right? And how your clients will be impacted in their, um, in their experiences within society, okay? Now, here's one of the things I want to talk about. In our last lesson, we talked about this notion that when we are not aware of our privilege, when we have not checked our privilege, we may unknowingly or unintentionally, okay, have the potential to um, hurt others. And, and I'm talking about emotionally, right? Hurt others through our words as a result of these blinders that we have on regarding privilege. And that's why it's so important to check our privilege. So what I want to talk about is this notion of microaggressions, microaggressions, okay, and what that means. And in a nutshell, basically what a microaggression is, and, and this is, we're using this in the context of race, but I'm going to give you some examples of what microaggressions look like outside of that with other mar marginalized populations in the next few slides. But in regards to race, racial microaggressions uh, are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, okay, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights or insults towards people of color. That's in a racial context, okay? So what's really important to understand is that usually when we engage in microaggressions, and I'm using the term we, because in some examples that I'm going to give you in a few slides, we all, all right, have been guilty of utilizing some of these, these microaggressions. Again, not with this intent, right, to hurt or to harm others, but we don't even realize what we're saying or the context in which it's been used in the past, all right? And, and what we actually are doing is we're contributing to the degrading, the demeaning of others. An example of a racial microaggression that you might see um, um, through, and then it's nonverbal, okay, is you'll see this along the uh, out in public is have you ever sat and watched okay racial um, dynamics at play or maybe and socioeconomic status in play where I've seen for example individuals of color walking by and you'll see either maybe sometimes it's a lighter skinned individual Caucasian it could be older or even younger that when that person of color walks by you know you'll see a woman holding and clutching her purse right or someone watching to see where they're walking or where they're going to and so that in itself is a microaggression that an assumption has been made that that individual of color, all right, should be, should be watched carefully and should be potentially even concerned on whether or not you're going to be robbed as a result of what you look like. Now, let me give you some other examples of microaggressions um, and what that looks like. So microaggressions are more typical than the overt racism. Yeah, you'll still see, unfortunately, in our society, overt racism marches right towards, let's say, white supremacy, um, the Charlottesville um, tragedy that occurred and the campaign for white supremacy that took place there, right? Um, those all still have a presence in our society, but microaggressions, um, what we recognize, do more harm in the long term because they're subtle. Okay, they're subtle, they become micro insults, micro invalidations, subtle ways of nullifying who a person is through just the seemingly innocent remark or, or, or just sort of backhanded comment. Okay, and so let me give you some examples of microaggressions that we may hear in our society. And again, comfortable, right? Um, not necessarily comfortable but always a safe environment. And so I'm gonna speak very openly about some of these microaggressions. You'll hear things like people saying, oh, those illegal aliens, okay? Well, actually, um, that is a term that's used, illegal aliens, but we start to refer to is that they are, are still a person. They are more than their citizenship, that yes, while they are entered, um, let's say, across the country's borders, in fact, illegally, they are still a father, a mother, a child to someone, a human being, and a child of God. And so to label someone as purely by their citizenship status reduces that person down to a legal term, all right? And what happens is, is when we begin to nullify, 
all right, the existence or the dignity of a human being, then it becomes easier for us to begin to degrade and discriminate against them, to treat them differently because we're no longer seeing them as a person. We've given them a name, I'm sorry, a status, okay? You'll hear other terms like that's so gay, right? That was very popular even a few years ago to say, oh, that's so gay, or he would say no homo, and we would say that to someone. And the problem is what we've done is we've said that, for example, if something wasn't to be enjoyed, if something was considered what we also might describe as lame or um, undesirable, and we call it gay, then what we're also inferring is individuals who might identify as gay, all right, um, are therefore less desirable or hold less status. We've reduced that person down to an insult in saying that whatever it is that you are referring to as gay is synonymous, okay, with less. Okay, there's a term that you'll hear all the time, even saying that's so ghetto, right? We'll say, oh, that was so ghetto, that movie was so ghetto, that music was so ghetto, that outfit is so ghetto, whatever the case is, and you'll hear this term referred to. What may, some of you may be um, uh, um, attuned to or may have... Okay, sorry, we were recording. And I lost you for a quick second. I apologize for that. I don't know where that went. Let me go back to rescreening here and sharing my computer. So I'm so sorry about that. Zoom just kind of cut out on me on a, for a quick second here. Okay, we are back. I apologize for that. Um, don't know what happened there. Technical difficulties, but we are back. Okay. Where were we? We were on that's so ghetto, right? The microaggression, the micro insult of saying that's so ghetto. Okay. Some of you may actually know the term ghetto actually originated uh, during World War II, right? And um, during World War II, what happened was is that uh, Hitler rose to power and he came to power during this time. And uh, many people think or sometimes question this and how was it that during World War II, that Hitler could just come into play and begin to come into power and begin to systemically um, murder millions of individuals. Um, what's important to understand is, is that these, these microaggressions that Hitler engaged in didn't happen overnight. He didn't just immediately move into his, his position and begin to order the execution, systemic execution of uh, Jews, of also um, those who were developmentally disabled, of uh, individuals aside from disabilities, also who presented as part of the LGBTQ plus community, um, Catholics as well. Um, and so there was a number of people that Hitler targeted. What happened was over a series of a year, Hitler began to in, um, enact several laws. We're gonna talk about those in the coming slides. And what he did was he began, he began to restrict the movement of the Jewish population. So what he said was, well, if you're Jewish, we need to know that you're Jewish, so you need to wear an armband on your, on your, on your arm with the, the Star of David, signifying to us that you're Jewish. Well, now that we know that you're Jewish, what we're going to do is we're going to place some restrictions on when you can be out in public. So you can't be out after a certain time. Well, now that you also can't be out during a certain time, it's also going to be illegal for you to walk on the sidewalk. If you aren't German, you need to walk on in the gutter, all right? Because remember, he referred to the Jews as uh, rats. So he said, so after that, um, it's also going to be illegal for um, Jewish citizens to have their money in banks. And now he said, well, now it's illegal for Jew Jewish citizens to own property. This is no longer your property. This is the property of German citizens. So we took their property. He says, well, now that you don't have any money and you have nowhere to live, what we're going to do is move you into these areas designated, okay, by the Nazi party uh, called ghettos. And what he did was he systemically began to move crowd populations of Jewish individuals into ghettos. And after that happened, then he said, we have no need for certain individuals who have been classified in this ghetto. And we're going to transport them out and either to be murdered and other individuals will serve in internment camps until they are murdered at a later time. And so this notion of ghetto emerged from the oppression and the systemic murdering of individuals, but it is used nonchalantly in our culture now to describe uh, a socioeconomic status as well as a living situation of that, um, 
of that population. And so we have to be very careful because when we say something is ghetto, what we're really referring to is one of the most horrific events of oppression and systemic murder that has existed in our culture's history. You'll often hear this um, uh, term, that exam just raped me, okay? And what we're saying in that was some people believe it's this innocent term or just referring to, wow, I really didn't do well on an exam. The problem with that is we're talking about to a victim of sexual assault, in no way was the trauma that they experienced on any sort of level, right, as minor as not doing well on an exam. And so imagine what that would do to a person who has experienced sexual assault in their lives to hear their trauma, right, being um, compared to a D on a test, right? You'll hear terms like that so retarded. There are many individuals who face not only developmental disabilities, what we're gonna to refer to later in this class as diverse abilities, that not only may be seen by others, but there's plenty of people who have a diverse ability who go unnoticed. There are cognitive um, diverse abilities, there are speech diverse abilities, there are reading diverse abilities that people may carry with them at any point in their lives that we would never know unless we ask them. And so when we make a comment like that so retarded, what we're saying is, is an individual with a diverse ability carries less value than an able-bodied person. And this is an example of a microaggression. Finally, this last one here, this is something that I deal with every time I walk into a, uh, an airport. I kid you not, he looks like a terrorist, right? So you're seeing me with a little bit of a shorter beard than I normally have. I normally have one that's way bigger than this. And um, um, as a result of me having that beard and also being an individual of color, it is not uncommon at all that I qualify for all the extra screening at a security place, right? So every time I go through SeaTac Airport up in Seattle, I'm getting all the dogs coming and sniffing my bag. Anytime that I pass through TSA, I usually get the extra pat down or they wanna, they wanna check for you know, whatever gunpowder residue or powder residue on my bag. And so um, there's this notion of what does a terrorist look like and how do we perceive a terrorist in our country? When we look at the, the notion of terrorism and how we categorize it, we have made this a person of color issue, and we've also affiliated it with a particular religion, such as Islam, and we've also particularly with, with a part of the world in the Middle East. But another fact that we're missing is uh, many of the uh, domestic terrorist issues that we've had, such as mass bombings and mass shootings, have also come primarily from individuals from very different backgrounds, racial backgrounds, including Caucasian, including individuals who were also brought up in what we would describe as middle-class neighborhoods in the suburbs. And so as a society, what we've done is we've said, they look like a terrorist and we've put a face on what a terrorist looks like that doesn't necessarily align with the statistics that we've seen in this country, okay? So just some things to think about. Here are some further examples. This is an example of a positive, what appears to be a positive stereotype about Asians turned into a negative microaggression, right? Well, saying, you're Asian, why aren't you good at math? Operating under assumption that if you're Asian, you should be good at math or you should be good at science or whatever the case is. This is a positive stereotype. Again, stereotypes can be negative or positive, but now it's been placed into a microaggression because it's shaming an individual for saying that you somehow fall outside of a stereotypical norm, okay, that exists. You're acting so sensitive. Is it, the, is it, is it that time of the month? This is a microaggression towards women to say that women should, should not have a definite opinion or emotion about something that if, if a woman has a strong feeling about something, they're emotional. But if a man has a strong opinion about something, they're decisive and bold. And so what it does is reduces a woman's thought, decision, and emotions down to biology. And it's saying that a woman is less than and is not um, afforded the same opportunity to have an opinion about something because she is a woman. And that is a microaggression, okay? You'll hear this one, are you sure you're gay? I bet I could change your mind. This is reducing someone down to their sexuality and their sexual orientation by simply saying the sexual orientation is a choice and that they could change that choice if they just had a different sexual experience. This is another example of a microaggression. Where are you really from? There's a lot of people that have heard this several times and I've heard also from our students who identify um, with uh, their Asian uh, racial background 
also those who are, are, are from India that have stated, well, I look Indian, I look Asian, but someone will come up to me and ask me, so where are you from? And they'll be like, I'm from Wisconsin. And they'll say, oh, but yeah, I mean, where was your family from? And you hear this really awkward pause in that, right? And so there's this notion of, well, you look like you're from somewhere else, so you possibly can't be from here. And that's that notion of ethnocentrism, right? What does an American look like? Well, to some people, American looks very different from American that looks like something else, okay? Here's another common microaggression that was really popular um, in the 80s and 90s, okay? This notion of being colorblind to the world around us. And so you'll hear someone say, well, gosh, you know what? I don't see you as black. I don't see you as white. I don't see you as uh, Latino or Latinx, right? I, I just see you as the person that you are. It sounds harmless enough. It sounds nice. It sounds genuine, right? That you want to recognize that person for who they are. The problem is, though, if you've ever been oppressed or discriminated against because you are Black, because you are Hispanic, because you are Asian, because you are Native American, whatever the case is, what you're doing is you're just refusing to see the oppression and those traumatic experiences that an individual has experienced as a result of their race. And when you, so when you say, I don't see your race, what you're saying is, and even though you don't mean it this way, is I have not, I don't see you fully as the person that you are. And that can be a microaggression because it continues to feed into this negative self-talk that individuals may have about themselves. Really quickly, what I want to do then is I want to move into this theoretical concept of this. So what I want to do is talk about, it's one thing to have these microaggressions taking place amongst people. But if you notice, if enough of these microaggressions begin to perpetuate, then they become a culture, okay? And when they're part of our culture, what happens is they also get weaved into the notion of um, theory, okay, and the notion of practice. When we think about something, um, we also then act on those thoughts at times, and that theory that we have becomes practice. So I want to talk about the danger of when theory that's flawed, when it's rooted in racism or in inequality, the danger that that can lead to when it's put into practice, okay? So before we look at some theoretical concepts that have gone awry in society, let's first look at this definition of theory. So theory is defined as a plausible or scientifically acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain a phenomenon. Okay, another definition of theory is a belief, policy, or procedure proposed or followed as the basis of action. Theory then basically, let me just kind of break this down into a little bit more uh, tangible um, or you know, definitions. Theory is an idea or understanding of how some aspect of human behavior is organized. It enables us to make predictions about human behavior. We're all still human beings, we're all still on the animal kingdom, right? And so part of what we do is attempt to make sense of our surroundings. Normalcy, when we know what we can expect, means we can worry less about all of those, those um, unanticipated variables. And so sometimes theory is a way for us to attempt to understand human behavior and what is normal for human behavior, okay? So what I wanna talk about here is the intersectionality of theory and practice. When theory and practice come together and they intersect, okay, then what happens is this is how systemic oppression can take root, okay? So theories are formulated so we can understand predict or explain phenomena, right? It's just an innocent piece of us trying to understand the world around us. Theory creates though a framework for understanding, experiencing and interacting with the world around us. Okay, so that's important to understand. Theory is a tool for identifying a problem and creating a course of action to correct the problem. But there's a catch. Theory can be used to support oppression or it can be used to support equality, right? It's not dedicated to one or the other. So you can use theory and apply it into practice to do good, or you can use it to apply practice into evil, okay? So people will say, well, look, why does this happen? Why do these things happen? So theory shapes our understanding. What we do and to whom, it, it, it shapes our practice, okay? And then from there, what happens is we develop systems, policy, legislation, and ways of stratifying, okay? Consolidate, or um, sorry, stratifying or organizing individuals in our society. 
Okay, and as a result of that, the practices, the things we do can be just or unjust, okay? They can either unify or they can divide us. They can promote equity or they can promote marginalization. Now, I know I kind of went off into a theoretical sort of tangent there, so let me break this into very simple terms. This is what happens when theory is used for evil, okay? Let's go first into this example, number one, of pre-World War II anti-Semitism, okay? Now, it's important to understand I'm talking about race theory here, not critical race theory. Those are two separate things. Race theory was a belief, okay, prior to critical race theory, which is what you're going to learn more of in the MSW program. Race theory was this belief that there were superior and inferior races. Okay, this goes back actually prior to World War II, where we believed as in science that there was a hierarchy of individuals and usually the fairer in skin, the more intelligent and advanced that race was. The darker in skin you went on the spectrum, they believed that you were less able to learn and apply um, cognitive thought the same way that lighter skinned races did. And so they just said, that if you were darker, basically, that you didn't function at the superiority of those that were lighter, okay? Some races were destined, therefore, according to race theory, to be conquered, and others were destined to do the conquering. This is the notion of Aryan race, that the Aryan race believe, that be and, and to a degree still believes, that they are superior, and that it's their job and responsibility to conquer and oversee all other races, okay? Science actually supported race theory by the eugenics movement, okay? The notion that our genes genetically have been created in superior and inferior forms. And, since, and so science said, no, there is actually proof of this within our biology is the example that was being used. As a result of this, Hitler used race theory um, to justify the decisions that he made, both legislatively and in policy. So, when Hitler came to power, uh, one of the things that he did, and I gave you examples of this earlier, was he engaged in what are called the Nuremberg Race Laws. And in 1935, and what this was, was a series of 400 national decrees made by the um, um, uh, Socialist Party of Germany, the Nazi Socialist Party, okay, um, to uh, impact all aspects of Jewish public and private life. And so this is where all of those laws, like you have to wear an armband, you cannot walk on the sidewalk, you cannot uh, put your money in German banks, you're not entitled to own property any longer. All of these other things were actually put into national decrees. And what this led to was separation of races, religions, and political affiliations on behalf of the final of the Nazi government. And what that did was positioned Hitler to be able to uh, in, uh, implement what he referred to as his final solution which resulted in the enslavement and the murder of six million Jewish individuals and others that I mentioned also LGBTQ plus Catholic individuals with disabilities um, during World War II. Race theory put into practice uh, institutionally, okay, led to social inequalities and was used as a basis to justify genocide, okay, and the abuse of an entire race. Let me give you one more example. This was pre-Civil War, justification for slavery, institutional, just like we saw in World War II, right? An earlier example. 12.5 million Africans, okay, plucked from the shores of Africa were enslaved and transported to the New World. Now, in that journey through the Middle Passage, 10.7 million survived that journey, okay? Staggering loss right off the bat of nearly 2 million individuals who lost their lives in that, in that passage. Okay, now approximately of that number, 600,000 were brought to North America. Now, race theory was used to justify all of this, saying that while well, we believe that there's superior and inferior races, it is our God-given right, therefore, if we are of an Aryan race or a lighter skin race, to govern those who are lesser than us and so we are acting on our right to enslave under individuals. This was the rationale that was applied in the past to justify slavery. Lincoln was elected president in 1860. And so race theory was challenged by some churches, abolitionists, politicians, and world powers. But we have to understand this is, this is epic 
for that to be challenged because science was backing this at the time saying, no, there is such a thing as inferior and superior races. So as a result, if you challenged race theory, you sounded like you were the crazy one, right? So Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. It was not met well. In fact, Lincoln had to actually implement it twice. He had to actually had to come back and say, no, I was serious, folks. When I said that it is illegal and we need to free the slaves, all right, I meant it, okay? Legislation was challenged politically and militarily. This led to obviously the Civil War and the practice of emancipating slaves led to subsequent socio and political movements advocating for socially just government systems and legislation, the civil rights movement, the opposition of Jim Crow uh, law, which we will talk about later in class, and also um, as well as the voting rights, okay, uh, through the March on Selma, all right, as a, as, a, as a result of this. So see, this is a perfect example of where theory um, and flawed thinking of racial superiority and inferiority impacted millions of human beings for generations to come. Okay. Here's what I want to do before we go into the next slide. I want to give you some examples of what racial inequality in a positive light in a social movement engaged towards transforming, moving away from social, I'm sorry, from racial inequality and racism trying to move a population into the light of integration, right, and, um, and desegregation um, can do while also um, unpacking this notion of social justice terminology. So what I want to do is, a, a fun fact about me that I don't, I don't know if you know, you probably don't, is that um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., okay? There's actually three people in life that have impacted me in my own development profoundly in my life. And I'll, and I'll say number one in, in, in the highest, lowest order, but in this order, number one is Jesus. Number two is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And number three is Fred Rogers. That's actually Mr. Rogers, right, from the TV show. I know that seems odd, but trust me, stay with me in the rest of this term. It's gonna make sense by the end. Okay, um, Dr. King's speeches, that were recorded. Um, I have studied all of those through the course of my doctoral work. Um, my program had an emphasis in social justice. We analyzed the speeches of Dr. King. I've read all of Dr. King's books that he has written. Um, we have talked about um, and have engaged in the studying of the ethics, the legislation, the considerations for social movements led by King and the notion of peaceful resistance, right? Nonviolent resistance. And so, um, um, I use and reference Dr. King heavily in my teaching. And so what I'd like to be able to do is um, share some content with you, which will further unpack the language of social justice while also discussing the notion of racial inequality uh, in the United States, okay, for us to understand the notion of oppression a little bit better. So here's what I'd like for us to do. I'd like for us to transport ourselves back in time, okay? On June 6, 1961, Dr. King delivered a speech uh, called The American Dream to Lincoln University. Now, one of the things that I love about this speech, it, it is dripping with social justice content and jargon. This speech is rich with social justice terminology. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna play this speech. I want us to listen along with the speech and listen to the discussion about racial inequality that existed in the United States during the civil rights era. Now, what I typically do when we meet live is as we're listening to this speech together, all right, what I do is actually write on the board the social justice um, um, language that emerges that King uses in his speech. Instead, what we're gonna do, because we're doing this virtually, is I'm gonna bring up the chat column on the right-hand side of the screen. And what I would like you to do is sit back Close your eyes, picture Dr. King standing in front of you in the midst of a crowd and listening to the speech that's delivered. As we move through the speech, I'm going to type the social justice terminology in the chat so that you can see the language that's emerging. And the reason I want you to do that is so that you can see this is the, the language of social justice. Now, one of the things that I truly also love about this speech is you're getting a fiery king here, okay? If you read any of King's books, you see King like 
on fire. Like he is in the groove. He is making his debates. He's presenting his logic, okay? And it's really inspiring to read. There are some speeches where along King's journey, um, King was a little tired. He was worn down in some of his speeches. At times, King was also frustrated with the movement because he was hoping for more progress but wasn't seeing it in all arenas. What you're getting here in this particular speech is a motivated and inspired and a powerful king. And so that's what I want to present to you, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring up the speech on YouTube. Then I'm going to bring us back to the chat so that we can um, engage in this video together, okay? So what I would like to do is let's go ahead and um, get comfortable and let me bring up the speech and let's watch the language emerge, all right? I will type it on the screen as we listen to, to Dr. King. America is essentially a dream. It is a dream of a land where men of all races, of all nationalities, and of all creeds, can live together as brothers. The substance of the dream is expressed in these profound words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of the first things we notice in this dream is its amazing universalism. It does not say some men, but it says all men. It doesn't say some, it doesn't say all white men, but it says all men, which includes black men. It doesn't say all Gentiles, but it says all men, which includes Jews. doesn't say all Protestants, but it says all men, which includes Catholics. That is something else that we notice in this dream, which is one of the, the things that distinguishes democracy and our form of government with other totalitarian systems. It says that there are certain basic rights that are neither conferred by nor derived from the state. In order to discover where they came from, it is necessary to move back behind the dim mist of eternity. They are God-given, very seldom. Very seldom, if ever, in the history of the world has a socio-political document expressed in such profound, eloquent, and unequivocal language the dignity and the worth of human personality. For the American dream reminds us that every man is the heir of a legacy of dignity. And yet ever since the founding fathers of our nation dreamed this dream, America has been, to use a big word that the psychologists and the psychiatrists use, a schizophrenic personality, <laughs> tragically defined. <laughs> On the one hand, she has proudly professed the noble principles of democracy, and on the other hand, she has proudly practiced, or she has sadly practiced, the very opposite of those principles. Indeed, slavery and segregation 
have always been strange paradoxes in a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal. And so often, America has trampled over the dream. And so often, America has scarred this noble dream. We look and see certain states saying they will never comply with the law of the land. In doing this, America is scarring the dream. We notice people who merely want to be free, being brutalized, homes being bombed, churches being bombed. This is a way of scarring the American dream. We notice people who merely want to exercise their citizenship rights, being thrown into jail. This is a way of scarring the dream. And we can hear the voice of a little Emmett Till crying from the rushing waters of Mississippi. This is a way of scarring the dream. And so the Negro is still trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. And so often he has been pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing in the piercing chill of an alpine November. This is scarring the American dream. May I say to you, as has been said so eloquently all the afternoon, this dream is being scarred not only in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and all of the southern states, but it is being scarred in New York, in uh, Illinois, in Pennsylvania, and I imagine even in California. So the fact is that the Negro all over America is still the last hide and the first five, and he still can't live where he wants to live and where his money can get him to live. But today, more than ever before, America is challenged to bring this noble dream into reality. For the shape of the world today does not afford us the luxury of an, of an anemic democracy. And the price that the United States must pay for the continued exploitation of the Negro and other minority groups is the price of its own destruction. Yeah. People are looking over to the United States today and they're wondering what we are doing about this problem. They're looking over from Asia and Africa. For years, most of these people have been dominated politically exploited economically, segregated, and humiliated by some foreign power. But today they are gaining their independence, more than 1 billion, 600 million of the former 1 billion, 800 million colonial subjects have their independence today. And they are saying in no uncertain terms that racism and colonialism must go. The hour is late, and the clock of destiny is ticking out, and we must act now before it is too late. It is trite but urgently true that if America is to remain a first-class nation, she can no longer have second-class citizens. I must hasten to say that we must not solve this problem merely to meet the communist challenge. We must not seek to solve this problem merely to appeal to Asian and African peoples. This problem must be solved in the United States because segregation and discrimination are morally wrong. The 
must be solved because segregation relegates persons to the status of things and stands against all of the noble principles of our Judeo-Christian heritage. It must be solved not merely because it is diplomatically expedient, but because it is morally compelling. This must be said all over the world. And I would say that there are some things that we must continue to do in order to make the American dream a reality and save our nation in this hour. And I would like to mention them as briefly as possible and elaborate on them briefly. First, in order to make the American dream a reality, we must seek to make the world dream a reality and therefore we must begin with a world perspective. Well, you see, the world in which we live is geographically one. And now we are challenged to make it spiritually one. Now, it is true that the geographical oneness of this age in which we live came into being to a large extent through man's scientific ingenuity. For man, through his scientific genius, has been able to dwarf distance and place time in change. Yes, we've been able to carve highways through the stratosphere, and our jet planes have compressed into minutes distances that once took days. And Bob Hope has described this new jet age in which we live, and I think he's given an adequate description. He said it is an age in which it is possible to take a non-stop flight from Los Angeles to New York, and if on taking off in Los Angeles you develop hiccups, you will hick in Los Angeles and cup in New York City. <laughs> You know, it is possible because of the time difference to take a flight from Tokyo, Japan on Sunday morning and arrive in Seattle, Washington on the preceding Saturday night. And when your friends meet you at the airport and ask when you left Tokyo, you will have to say, I left tomorrow. <laughs> this is the kind of world in which we live. This is a bit humorous, but I'm trying to laugh at basic fact and all of it, and it is simply this. And through our scientific genius, we made of the world a neighborhood. And now, through our moral and ethical commitment, we must make of it a brotherhood. We must all learn to live together as brothers, or we will all perish together as fools. This is what we must do. And it simply means that every nation must be concerned about every other nation. Every individual must be concerned about every other individual. Some months ago, Mrs. King and I journeyed over to that great country known as India. I never will forget the experience, the experience of talking with and meeting with the great leaders of India, and meeting people in the cities and the villages all over that country. A noble and marvelous experience. And I say to you this afternoon, there were those depressing moments. For how can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes millions of people going to bed hungry at night? How can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes millions of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night? In Calcutta, more than a million people sleep on the sidewalks every night. They have no beds to sleep in. They have no houses to go in. How can one avoid being depressed when he discovers that out of India's population of 400 million people, more than 365 million make an annual income of less than $60 a year, and most of these people have never seen a doctor or dentist. As I know disease conditions, something within me cried out, and we in America stand idly by and not be concerned, and an answer came, oh no, for the destiny of India and the destiny of every other nation is tied up with the destiny of the United States, and the destiny of the United States is tied up with the destiny of India. And I started thinking about the fact that right here in America we spend more than a million dollars a day to store surplus food, and I found myself saying, I know where we can store that food, free of charge in the wrinkled stomachs of the hundreds and millions of people who go to bed hungry at night. And 
Maybe we've spent far too much of our money in the United States establishing military bases around the world rather than bases of genuine concern and understanding. All I'm saying is simply this, that all life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly, it affects all indirectly. As long as that is extreme poverty in this world, no man can be totally rich even if he has a billion dollars. As long as diseases are rampant, as long as diseases are rampant and millions of people cannot expect to live more than 28 or 30 years, no one can be totally healthy even if he just got a checkup in the finest clinic of the nation. Strangely enough, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the way the world is made. This is the interrelated structure of reality. John Donne caught it years ago and could place it in graphic terms. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Then he goes on toward the end to say, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. This is the meaning of having a world perspective if we are to realize the American dream. The other point is that we must get rid of the notion once and for all that there are superior and inferior races. We must make it clear all over this land and all over the world that a doctrine of white supremacy has no basis in anthropology, has no basis in scientific thinking, and has no basis in morality. Now, you know, people used to argue, this thing still gets around, people used to argue that the Negro uh, was inferior by nature, and they went back in the Bible and they would get up certain passages in the Bible. It's a strange thing how people will use religion often to justify their prejudices. And they would go back in the Bible and they would say now the Negro is inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. And you know that was a great philosopher back in Greek philosophy by the name of Aristotle who did a great deal to set up formal logic and he would have what was known as a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so one brother, during the days of slavery, wanted to justify slavery, and uh, he had set his argument up on the framework of Aristotle's thinking. He could say, now, all men are made in the image of God. And then came his minor premise, God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro, therefore the Negro is not a man. This is the kind of reasoning that prevailed. But today, uh, we don't hear these arguments too much. Uh, they argue now on more cultural and subtle sociological grounds. Uh, the Negro is not culturally ready for integration. And uh, if you integrate uh, schools and if you integrate too much, uh, the Negro will pull the white race back a generation. And then they go on to say, you know, that the Negro is inherently criminal and uh, all of these things. Now, these people never say to us that many of these problems are problems of urban dislocation and that poverty, ignorance, and disease breed crime, whatever the racial group may be, that these conditions are environmental and not racial. And it is a torturous logic to use the tragic results of segregation and dis discrimination as an argument for the continuation of them. The thing to do is to get rid of them. So over this nation, we must get rid of the notion once and for all if we want to realize the dream that there are superior and inferior races. Now that is the final point that we must, the final thing that we must do in order to realize the American dream. 
We must continue to engage in creative protest to break down the barriers of segregation and discrimination. Now I know that there are those people who are the victims of some strange illusions, and uh, they don't believe in the necessity for continued pro protest. One illusion is a myth of time. They say, uh, just wait and don't push things and be patient and pray and, and time will work this problem out. You've heard that, I'm sure. <laughs> These people fail to realize that time is neutral and it can be used positively or negatively. We've seen this myth at work in the South. And the fact is that the segregationists at points have made a much more effective use of time than some other sources of goodwill, even the federal government. And I am convinced that we may have to repent not only for the blatant vitriolic words of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Talking about time. We must get rid of the notion that human progress rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. We must come to see that human progress is never inevitable. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. We must make it clear that the time to do right is now and that the time is always right to do right. Now, the other illusion is the myth of educational determinism, as I call it. You've heard these people say, now you've got to change the hearts of men. That's the only way you can solve it. And I guess that's true, uh, to solve it ultimately. And they say, it takes education to solve this problem. It's an educational process. And therefore, it can't be done through legislation. It can't be done through judicial decrees. It can't be done through executive orders by the President of the United States. It must be done through education. Now, I, I, I think it's right that education must work in this whole area, but it is both education and legislation, not either legislation or education. <laughs> now, it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. <laughs> I guess it is true that uh, the law can't make a man love me. Religion and education must do that. But the law can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important, too. And so it means that we must push on in legislation, in the North and in the South. Every state should have a Fair Employment Practice Commission so that there will be no discrimination in this area. Every state needs a fair housing law so that it will be made clear that there can be no discrimination in housing publicly or privately, and that even real estate people who will try to perpetuate this will have to stand before the bar of justice. This must be done all over the United States. <laughs> then we must continue to delve deeper into the philosophy of nonviolent resistance. That is something about this method that has power. And I know that there are those who will ridicule it occasionally, but it has worked miracles in the South. It has morality with it because it gives us the opportunity to work to secure moral ends through moral means. This is the morality of it, but it has certain practical consequences. It exposes the moral defenses of the opponent, somehow weakens his morale, and all at the same time it is working on, its, on, on his conscience. It disarms him and he just doesn't know what to do with it. If he puts you in jail, that's all right. 
If he doesn't put you in jail, fine. If he beats you up, that's all right. If he doesn't beat you up, that's all right. If he tries to kill you, all right. You develop the quiet courage of dying if necessary without killing. If he tries to threaten you, all right. If he doesn't. And that is something about it which causes the opponent not to know what to do. Now, he would know what to do with violence. He could call out the state militia. He could call out the National Guard and kill hundreds and hundreds of innocent people and argue that they are inciting a riot. They know how to handle violence, but they proved over and over again that they don't know how to handle nonviolence because they throw people... They try to handle it by throwing us in jail. But what happens? We go into the jails of Jackson, Mississippi and transform these jails from dungeons of shame to havens of freedom and human dignity. I can't stop it. I believe firmly that this is the way. Now, that is another aspect of it, about this method. And people ask me about it all the time. So, what do you mean when you tell us to love these people who are beating on us and bombing our houses and kicking our children around? What in the world do you mean when you say love such people? And I always have to stop and try to define the meaning of love in this area. And interestingly enough, Greek philosophy comes to our aid at this point. There are three words in the Greek language for love. One of them is the word eros. Now, Eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Uh, the philosopher Plato talks about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. It has come to us to mean a sort of romantic love, and so we all know about Eros. We've experienced it. We've read about it in the beauties of literature. In a sense, Edgar Allan Poe was talking about Eros when he talked about his beautiful Annabelle Lee with a love surrounded by the halo of eternity. In a sense, Shakespeare was talking about Eros when he said, Love is not love, which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark. You know, I can remember that because I used to quote it to my wife when we were quoting. That's Eros. That's Eros. Then the Greek language talks about phileo, which is another level of love. It is an intimate affection between personal friends. On this level, we love because we are love. We love people that we like. This is friendship. Then the Greek language has another word called agape. Agape is more than romantic love. Agape is more than friendship. Agape is not something affectionate. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. And when one rises to love on this level, he loves men not because he likes them, but he loves every man because God loves him. And he goes on with that. And so he rises to the level of hating the system rather than the individual who is caught up in that system. He loves the person and hates the evil deed. And I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say like your enemies because it's pretty difficult to like some people. It's difficult to like people bombing your home and threatening your children and kicking you about. But Jesus says, love them, and love is greater than like. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. And somehow, more and more, I've come to believe this. Yes. That this is the way that we will get out of this dark night of oppression and make of this nation a better nation. It means that we can stand up and allow the, allow the opposition to know that we will not accept injustice. Yes. We will stand up against it with our lives, yes. but we will never stoop down to the level of violence and hatred. And we will come to that point when we will be able to convince him that a new world is emerging. And I tell you this evening that it will give us the right attitude. I know sometimes how discontent we get, and we have a right to get discontent, and how frustrated we get in the process sometimes. But I submit to you this evening that this way of nonviolence will help us 
not to seek to rise from a position of disadvantage to one of advantage, thus subverting justice. We will not substitute one tyranny for another, for black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. <laughs> this afternoon that God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race and the creation of a society. I believe with this method and this approach we will be able to win. And finally, as we struggle, we do not struggle alone. It's dark sometimes. It's difficult particularly for those who are struggling in the deep south facing all of the violence and all of the suffering. That is something that consoles us along the way. We are convinced that our cause is right. I return to Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, not in despair, not in bitterness. I return knowing that we are moving into a bright day of freedom. Yes, we, through our struggles, through our suffering, through our sacrifice, will be able to achieve the American dream. And this will be the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, and God Almighty, we are free at last. Okay, let me go ahead and pause that. And let me take us back to the sharing um, PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. So I hope that you found that speech um, invigorating as I did. I think a lot of times, you know, we've heard the speeches of Dr. King, right? And we have only heard fractions of the speeches. We've heard, you know, the I Have a Dream speech was, was absolutely phenomenal, but we tend to only listen to one clip. When it takes out of context um, the depth and the complexity of King's speeches, um, I'm trying to actually, let me see, for some reason, my, let me stop sharing for a second and let me bring back the PowerPoint um, because it was, it was glitching for a quick second. So let's try this again. Okay. For some reason, I'm still getting that glitch. Hold on one second. I apologize for that. So let's do it this way. Let's try one more thing. I apologize. Screen. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. Think we're set. Yes. Okay. So the reason why I wanted to present this to you is because it talks beautifully about social justice language. All of that language that I was extracting from the speech is the language and the themes associated with social justice. Okay. King was always intentional about the language that he used. Nothing was mishapped. Nothing was ad-libbed. He was, he was deliberate about the language used during this movement because he knew it was important to bring everyone on board. And so King's speech was seen as radical during this time. It shook the foundations of racial inequality that existed to the point where we all know he was assassinated over his beliefs. At the time King delivered this speech, he was also listed by the FBI as the number one most dangerous person in the country. King, who preached peaceful resistance, right? And so this is really important to understand because what King was saying was so radical. What King was doing was challenging several institutional concepts of oppression that seem to be the norm, same as race theory, same as what happened in Nazi Germany, same as what happened in slavery. But King challenged these, um, 
these positions head on. So what King did was he challenged Jim Crow in the Deep South. The Jim Crow laws that justified the murder, the lynching, and the um, restriction of voting in the Deep South, um, he challenged directly. He challenged legislators who implemented these laws and allowed them to perpetuate. He challenged politicians who, running, who were running for social um, offices and political positions that would have manifested or continued the status quo. King challenged the education system. He talked about segregation and integration and said it was taking too long. He challenged law enforcement, right, to be able to say that, yeah, you know, education, it may take time to educate and change the hearts of those who maybe have racist views, but you need to enforce the laws that are in place in order to keep us from being lynched, right? He challenged bigots, and we obviously know that, but he also challenged passive citizens. He said, if you are remaining neutral during this time, if you're just staying silent and watching this and hoping it gets better, shame on you as well. And so the King was calling everyone out in this speech. He also challenged the church and said that the church had used the Bible as justification for discrimination and segregation, okay? And finally, he said he challenged the black community, and this was really, in particular, a strong statement to do because what he did was he said, look, I'm not asking for us to switch positions in power and for us to now take turn and uh, oppress white um, citizens. What I'm calling for as a community is to be just to one another, to have uh, to honor the human dignity of all human beings and God's creatures. And as a result of that, I'm not calling for black supremacy is what he said. In fact, he said black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. And so we saw these themes emerge, just a couple of things, um, you know, the world perspective, we can't have a first class nation without second class citizens. And obviously he boiled this down to look, this is not a legal issue anymore. Um, white supremacists continue to make this issue a legal one, saying that, well, we have laws in place and all of this. He says, this is a moral and ethical issue. We are morally obligated to do better than what we are doing uh, in our country regarding our laws, okay? So I want you to kind of just think about, you know, think about for you and, and, and your reaction to the speech, what were two points from King's speech that resonated with you? Now, Wessel, what, what did he know in terms of majority groups that were noted? He talked about this, right? He talked about law enforcement. He talked about politicians. He talked about the housing authority. He talked about um, uh, hiring practices and healthcare. So he talked a lot about majority groups that were listed. Um, think about the forms of sub subjugation and discrimination that were taking place. Think about some of those isms that were manifested in this speech. What I loved about his speech also, he talked about the micro, meso, and macro levels of social justice themes. He talked about individuals, excuse me, making a difference in society, but he also went all the way up to the federal level and said the laws need to change too. So yes, human beings need to love one another, but our laws and our institutions need to represent that love as well. It needs to be manifested in the social commitment and obligations that we have to one another through our institutions. And finally, and this is probably the most bothersome part of all of this, is what elements of Dr. King's message are still relevant today? Unfortunately, there are some things that he was saying that are still relevant to this very day in regards to race relations in our country. And so this is why I wanted to bring King's speech to the forefront, a message that he delivered in 1961 in some aspects is still very valid by today's standards. So finally, um, a little bit about what I want to do here is I'm actually going to move on because I know this has been a little bit of a lengthy lecture. You can go back and redo, remove, or, um, review that material, I'm sorry if you want, but as promised I wanted to give you a scenario to work with um, that resulted in, again, a real case that I worked um, and this one covers working with uh, marginalized populations related to race, okay? So here's a real example of something I encountered. Let's say you've been assigned to work with a youth who is returning from foster care back to their biological family. Upon earning, entering the family's home, you notice a large six foot Confederate flag hanging on the wall, a picture of Adolf Hitler on the, camp, on the mountain, and another large white flag with a black silhouette of a firearm with the words, come and take it on the flag. It looked like this, okay? This is the flag that was also hanging in the in the house with, the, with those other flags, okay? Um, how would you approach working with this family? What information might you want to seek during your assessment? 
So something to consider with all of this, this was um, a family that I worked with, uh, local to the, uh, you know, Riverside area, I'll say it was within Riverside County. Um, I went to the home um, and when I knocked on the door to meet with this particular family, um, a large gentleman, uh, about six foot four, um, big, I'm saying talking probably 300 plus pounds, fully tattooed on his neck, fully tattooed on his head, which was shaved, uh, uh, horns of the ram down the side here, um, SS bolts on his eyes, swastikas on his arms, um, 8-8, eight, eight, okay, on his arms as well, was there. Um, this man opened the door. And he was the first uh, person that I encountered in this family. And I had to quickly think about how I was going to roll with this, right? And so what I did was I said, you know, good afternoon. I introduced myself. I said where I was from. And then I said, uh, you know, I'm here regarding, you know, um, your son returning home. Uh, and I'm wondering um, if it would be possible for me to come in. He said, sure, come on in. And when I came in, this flag was there, right? So some of you may know that this flag um, is currently has the connotation of uh, representing uh, Second Amendment rights in terms of uh, gun rights and gun right advocates. Advocates also use this here as a representation to support um, Second Amendment right, okay, to keep and bear arms. Um, this flag also has historical influence because the silhouette here in the center of the AR-15 rifle, uh, in the original print of the flag was actually the silhouette of a cannon. Uh, referencing um, a uh, battle which was held um, by a small outpost in Texas that defended itself against a large army um, and utilized the term come and take it to challenge that army who was coming to take their arms, their cannon, okay? And so there's a history behind this flag, but it is more commonly used now for Second Amendment rights advocates, okay? Um, so I sat down with this dad, um, Hitler on the mantle, um, Confederate flag on the wall. And I introduced myself and I said, hey, I'm here um, to serve you and your family um, to hopefully give you a few skills of whatever it is that you need in terms of support so that this placement can be successful. My goal is that you and your son can be together in your house again and not having to move around in foster care anymore. And my responsibility is to make sure you have what you need as a family to be successful. And the dad was sitting there and he was nodding his head and, um, you know, kind of waiting to see what I was going to say. And I said, uh, looked around at the walls and I looked over at this flag here. And I said, um, sir, you know, I uh, was just wondering, are you a uh, firearms fan? And he said, why, yes, I am. He said, well, I can't own firearms anymore due to my, my uh, criminal background. But yes, I am a fan. I was a fan of firearms back in my day. And I said, uh, that's pretty cool. I said, you know, my dad is uh, law enforcement retired law enforcement and military. And, uh, you know, so I, I grew around with some familiarity with that. I said, uh, you know, so we got to talking a little bit about firearms. And I remember in my first lecture, I talked about that it's our responsibility as social workers to find the common line. So I'm literally sitting in a house where I probably don't agree with this guy on a philosophical um, level, on a political level, or whatever the case is, I'm not seeing a see eye to eye with him, but I had to find something quick as a common denominator. And so we got to talking for probably about 20 minutes about firearms and his interest in them. At the end of that conversation, I stopped and I said to him, hey, can I ask you a question? He said, sure, you can ask whatever you want. I said, um, am I okay? Um, and will you still have me here um, if I continue to serve your family? And he says, well, why wouldn't I be? I said, well, you know, I, I also just want to be completely upfront with you. I noticed that you have the Confederate flag posted, and I noticed the picture that was on your mantle. And um, I just want to ask, am I okay? Am I okay being here? You know, and he said, look, I want my son back, and I want this place to, to be successful. And, and this is a common term or phrase that's used by white supremacists. He says, I just want to be me and I'm not trying to hold anyone down, but I'm proud of being me. And what he was referring to was, I'm proud of being white and I'm not necessarily trying to hold you down. Now, do I personally agree with that statement? Probably not, okay? But at the same time, he was saying, look, I just want this case to close. I'm just going to do whatever I need to do. And I said, that's fair enough. I said, so let me do this. 
um, I said, I'm going to have to return to the home over multiple occasions. I said, and actually a few of me and my team members are going to need to return because we want to continue to work with your family and give you the support that you need to be successful. I said, at the end of the day, though, I need you to understand that while I might be okay with some of the content in your home, and it is your home and you can do what you want with your home, I need you to also understand, though, that probably your probation officer is going to come over. Other social workers are going to come over to inspect the home at some point. Everyone's going to potentially have a different perception and reaction to the decorations that are in your home. I want to be upfront with you about that really quickly because I will not have a say in how other people handle, all right, some of the stuff that's in the house. He said, that's absolutely fine. I understand that, okay? Now, over the course of the next few months that we worked together, what I made sure of is that I knew, especially when I was going to have a rough meeting, when we had to talk about some of the issues that were coming up, I wanted to make sure that we still had a relationship, that common thread between us that we can rely on so that we can get have more commonalities sometimes than maybe differences in these conversations. And so in these conversations, before every meeting, before we talked about successes, I put some sort of firearm trivia on there, maybe something about a new model of some firearm that was being released or a, an article that was written. And I'm not an expert in this arena, but I knew where to go and get this information, right? And so I brought that to our meetings and we had discussions. He was able to talk about his interests. And then we moved into the case-related work. Sometimes what it means to be a social worker is building a relationship, some sort of rapport with someone who you never thought that you would be able to build rapport with. And I got to be honest with you, I don't think I changed any of this dad's views, okay, on what he thought about in terms of racial superiority, but I can tell you that we were able to get along amicably, close this case out successfully, and move on, okay? And so I wanted to share that story with you. Um, Let's see, let's skip this one for today. I will bring that one back into the next lecture and we'll do it that way. So um, let's end with our centering exercise for today. So as promised, one of the things that we're gonna do is end every lesson with a centering exercise. And all we're gonna do, just like in that last lecture, is our last lecture that I described about Brother Lawrence and the notion of centering, is spend two minutes right, quietly focusing on God's presence with us in this moment, reflecting on a scripture verse um, and, a, and a word to guide our thoughts, right? And so today, our centering verse will be, know this, my dear brothers, everyone should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And that comes from James chapter 1, verse 19. And our scripture, uh, or sorry, our focus word for today will be humility, humility. So what I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to do is while I pull up my timer here, is I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and put your hands and feet in a nice comfortable position, okay? Um, get comfortable, take a nice deep breath, and let's just think about for two minutes that we are present, that God is present with us in this moment. We are not alone. And what is God speaking into our hearts related to this verse from James about knowing this to be to be slow, um, quick to speak, quick to hear, sorry, slow to speak and slow to wrath. And how is God speaking into this notion of humility to us? Humility for me in that circumstance with that dad, or it was me humbling my own views and my desire, what I wanted to say personally to him, humbling myself to say, that's not going to be good for him and it's not going to be good for the child that we're serving. And ultimately my goal is to have a breakthrough with this dad on some level. And if I want to do that, I need to humble myself, right, and find the connection with this dad. So what does humility mean to you, right? What is God speaking into your heart regarding humility? Now, just a quick reminder before we go into the, the centering, if you're worried about something right now, if you're worried about something that happened before this lecture, if you're worried about something that's going to happen after, try to push all that out of your head. Try not to focus on anything else, but just be present in the moment with God, okay? So go ahead and take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I will keep track of our time.
Okay, go ahead and take a nice deep breath. Open your eyes. Welcome back. Really quick, I just want to send you a, a quick reminder. Thanks again for joining me for the lecture. I appreciate you all. Please check in for Blackboard for your assignments. Please remember to do that so you know what's due. Reach out to me with any questions. You are not bothering me. You may email me. Please do that, and I'm happy to set up an appointment with you, whatever that looks like. I'm fine with that. Know that, again, I am praying for you weekly. Know that, please. And also, um, I don't know if you're a fan of the office, but I thought this one would be funny, so enjoy that. Um, I want to say thank you so much. You have all been great. I appreciate you all. God bless, and I will see you in the next lecture.